one morning, Allison and I were actually going to get away for a day of R&R, and uh, we were about 13 miles from home. It was about 8.38 in the morning, and we got a call. We were just passing the intercoastal, um, leaving our home in Florida, um, get to 95 to head north for a, for a, for a full day of re you know, rest and relaxation. We got a frantic call from a nurse that is normally very cool, calm, and collected, and we knew something was drastically wrong. And immediately, I, I turned around and screeched towards home, sped towards home, and, uh, and the phone call was uh, just devastating. We're, I'm losing him. He's not breathing. He's purple. He's, he's, he's gone. There's no heart rate. I can't, the oximeter is not showing anything. I've got to go. I've got to go. And uh, I called 911. They're on their way. So Allison and I, that, that 13 miles driving home as fast as we could, again, as, as some of you sitting in those seats right now have experienced the same thing. We just, I, I remember Allison, uh, I remember Allison screaming, God, don't let it end here. This is not how it's supposed to happen. And, uh, you know, we got home, and uh, it was very, we were, they had an Ambu bag on Josh, and um and we were on the edge. We were teetering on the edge. And we went ahead and, and, and went through our normal progression. Allison jumped in the ambulance with Joshua and the paramedics. And I stayed at home, and I, um, I went ahead and packed up some equipment that I knew that we would need at the hospital if we had an extended stay. And I got to the hospital about an hour after Allison and Joshua did. And uh, we had learned, obviously, that uh, both lungs had collapsed. And um, he was in a very very delicate state. And again, as most of you know, these, uh, the uh, intensive care units cannot handle our children when they're critical like this because each nurse has three or four patients and our kids, our boys need 24-7 every second. They need attention every second of the day. So our system was that Allison would stay until 9 or 10 at night and I would spend the night. And then Allison would come and take over at 9 or 10 in the morning. I would go home and get some rest. I'm sure this is all very familiar to all of you. When we were in the hospital, Joshua couldn't talk. You know, he, he just wasn't loud enough to hear. So if I dozed off in the chair next to him, we always left the matchbox car next to him so he could bang on the metal railing with that matchbox car. So at about 2.10 in the, in the morning, I hear a tink, 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 tink. And this is after Joshua had been kind of comatose all, all day and all night. Two o'clock in the morning, and, and I, I kind of wake up and rub the sleep out of my eyes, and I look at Josh. His eyes are wide open, and he's looking at me, and he wants to talk. And uh, I, uh, um, he said, Dad, how you doing? And uh, I said, Josh, I, I'm doing good, as I'm standing up rubbing the sleep out of my eyes, trying to clear my head, get ready for an in-depth conversation. And um, he said, Dad, I'm glad I'm still here. And I said, well, Josh, I'm glad you're still here, too. And, and his statement just kind of dumbfounded me. And then his next statement was even more profound. He said, yeah, but I'm glad I didn't die today. And I sat there, and I was thinking, you know, in my infinite uh, wisdom of life and death, um, I said, well, I guess now's the time I need to talk to my son about life and death. And I said, well, Joshua, I'm glad you didn't die today either, and, and um, I'm so glad you're still here with us. And, you know, but Joshua, you know, we believe, um, we believe that we're going to see our loved ones in heaven again someday, and, and you know, all of us are going to die someday. And, uh, you know, and, and, but that's okay. And he says, yeah, but not until I'm old like Nana. Now, Nana was 72 years old at the time. And what I learned that instant was uh, that I, my words had confined my son and put his life into a box. And my son's words, and he was probably seven years old at the time, had defined his life. My words were confining. His words were defining. He had defined his life that he was going to live to the ripe old age of at least 72 and enjoy life like his Nana was enjoying life. And that's the mentality, the times that we are down. And if some of you there are very new to this journey, or some of you across the world are very new to this journey, I just encourage you, and we, we all just encourage you that you, it may not be a short journey. It may be a very long and hard journey. But when my son at 14 years old can say, Dad, I want a hug, and he can put his arm around my neck and say, Dad, I love you, um, it makes, it makes all the pain go away. 
And um, for those of you that, that have lost your children at younger ages, we can only pray and, and, and believe that uh, the efforts that are going to come out of this event, the efforts that are going to that are going to come out of uh, what Pam and Gary Scoggins have done over the years, and the efforts of our researchers and collaborators in research are going to bring change to the lives of these kids, period. And uh, that's what I believe is going to come out of this conference. 